Penneberry continues to insist she wasn't in her right mind when she pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in Saunders' death. Yes, the 26-year-old Inuk woman from Labrador was killed in her Halifax apartment just before Valentine's Day 2014. Hennebury and her boyfriend Blake Leggett pleaded guilty to the murder, but Hennebury is now trying to change that verdict. Reporter Blair Rhodes covered the original murder case. He's joining us now from Halifax. So, Blair, what happened today? Well, Victoria Henneberry, the first thing she tried was to get an adjournment. This is at least the second time in this process she's tried that. The three-member panel hearing the case refused to grant that. Henneberry has been given an extraordinary opportunity. The Nova Scotia Court of Appeal is hearing her case, even though she failed to meet the deadline for launching an appeal. However, the court wouldn't agree to have a government-funded lawyer work with Henneberry, so she's representing herself. Because of the huge public interest in the case, both here and in Newfoundland and Labrador, the court is live-streaming the proceedings on their website. You may be watching some of that video right now. Henneberry tried to argue that she has PTSD and anxiety and that prevented her from being in her right mind. But a psychiatrist who testified today questioned whether there is a real PTSD diagnosis. The Crown who prosecuted the case and one of the sheriffs who escorted her both testified that Henneberry appeared fine to them on the day she entered her guilty plea. Henneberry says the most she should be found guilty of is being an accessory after the fact. But one of the justices hearing the case, Justice Duncan Beveridge, told her that's not how it's likely to work. If we were to strike your plea to second degree murder, uh, our really only realistic option is to send you back for trial on first degree murder. That's the jeopardy you would face. Not to turn around and substitute a charge of criminal negligence or accessory after the fact or, or manslaughter. Now Blair, the Saunders family is attending this appeal hearing. What have they got to say? Well, they're frustrated that after all this time, they're still having to deal with this. And they're upset that they don't have a voice in this process. The reason we came was to make sure that everyone didn't put their eyes on her and pity her. And she going on with this sickness, she's sick. She looks healthier than me. Look at me, I lost 40-something pounds, right? Now, Miriam, her husband Clayton, and Loretta's sister Delilah say they'll be back in court tomorrow when Victoria Henneberry is supposed to make her final arguments. Carolyn. Thank you very much, Blair. That's uh, Blair Rhodes reporting live tonight. Well, last night we told you about the couple in paradise who worry that their dream home will go unfinished because of the financial problems of the builder Skymark. Well, tonight we're learning more about the money problems that plague the sole director of the future group of companies, St. John's real estate developer Craig Williams. Now, one of those companies is Skymark. In total, five of Williams' companies are working on a restructuring plan to deal with $20 million in debt. As the CBC sees hair reports, Williams' money problems started before Skymark ran into trouble last month. Five Hallett Crescent in St. John's behind me is the business address for 12 businesses owned by Craig Williams. His financial troubles began in 2016. His company in Nova Scotia, Skymark Homes Nova Scotia, defaulted on loan payments and was placed in receivership in January. The receiver in Nova Scotia is now working on a plan trying to sell 25 vacant home building lots in several neighborhoods in the Halifax area. Back in this province last May 2016, uh, Craig Williams business Barrico Atlantic announced that it was working on a plan to restructure its debt of about $3 million. $1.7 million was owed to secured creditors, $1.3 million to unsecured creditors. And about 20 years ago, in 1995, Greg Williams had some personal money problems too. He declared bankruptcy on about a million dollars in liabilities and was released from those debts. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. No! Lose $2,200 due to inflation. Well, this new ad time. from QP is taking aim at the Liberal government. The union represents thousands of provincial government workers. In the ad, QP accuses government of threatening to freeze workers' wages and cut their benefits. The union believes that's causing stress on families and in communities at a time when people are already struggling to make ends meet.
Well, get ready for a tear up on the way up Signal Hill. The city of St. John's is set to dig up the century old water main below Signal Hill Road and replace it with a brand new one. That'll take care of water main breaks that have damaged some neighborhood properties. The water main itself is just crumbling, Debbie, and uh, residents here have experienced flooding over the past number of years, two significant floods which caused major damage. The city has uh, allocated $2 million. We'll be beginning the work on April the 17th. It will start at the bottom of Signal Hill Road and it will go all the way up to the corner of Cabot Avenue. And it's just below the battery. That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's and my full interview with Councillor Galgay is coming up in just over 25 minutes. Well, a council member in Gander has been voted out of office. He resigned weeks ago after a complaint from the public, but council did not accept his resignation. Here now's Chris Ensing has been following this story. He joins us now live. So, Chris, what's happening at Town Hall? Well, it all has to do with a conflict of interest vote, a, a public complaint. Uh, Wayne Lorenzen is a counselor, or was a counselor here in Gander, and he had voted on a matter that involved his employer back in 2015. Now, the counselor said that he didn't vote in a way that benefited or vote in a way to try and benefit his organization, uh, just going through the process and said that as a frontline employee, not as a manager, there was no way that he made any benefits for the company off of this vote. Now, that member of public complained to council. Council launched an investigation to look into the claims and they were to hold a hearing. Wayne Lorenzen said that he would at first fight the uh, hearing that this claim saying there was no conflict of interest but then said he was going to resign as there was a conflict of interest. He did vote on something involving his employer. Now today at council they came up with what they found as the resolution to a hearing they held last night and voted unanimously to vacate his seat on council but they said they're not commenting on why they made that decision until Lorenzen has a chance to appeal. I caught up with counselor or former counselor Lorenzen as the meeting wrapped up and here's what he had to say. Members of your old town council there said that they're not going to make any public comment about this on advice of a legal position. Do you have any theory as to why they didn't just accept your resignation? Why they went through with the public hearing or the private hearing, the vote on it, and then to vacate that seat? Uh, at this moment, Chris, right now it's a bit of a head scratcher. That's all I can say. You know, I'm, I need to talk to my lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to be one, so I'm going to talk to him and let's see how this all gets, uh, pans out, hopefully in a positive way for me so I can run again and fall. If not, you know, the, the appeal aspect is there and, uh, and, you know, unfortunately in today's society, it's how deep your pockets are, how far you can pursue something if you go to, decide to go to a Supreme Court level. You know, it's, uh, I, personally, I feel the, uh, a ban right now would be, uh, I think it's a little bit too arbitrary right now based on the fact that I resigned March 31st and I became a citizen as, as of March 31st and no longer a counselor, so it's, this is all seems kind of silly, but let's see how it pans out. Now, you heard him talk about a ban. Because of council's decision, Lorenzen said that he's banned uh, for the next two years if the decision upholds if he were to appeal. Uh, if that's the case, he can't run in the election in the fall. Lorenzen said when he resigned, he wanted to leave this up to the voters, put all the facts out there and let them decide whether or not he could join council again in the fall elections. Uh, but it looks like there's still a lot to play out before we get to that point. Reporting live in Gander, I'm Chris Ensing for Here and Now. Well, there's word tonight that Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro is charged with six safety violations. Occupational Health and Safety laid the charges after a worker was seriously injured. The incident happened two years ago at the Holy Regenerating Station. A Hydro employee was taken to hospital after being burned while working on a thermal unit. The Crown Corporation is scheduled to appear in provincial court early next month. Cornerbrook singer-songwriter Sherman Downey is facing a major setback. Two of his prized guitars were stolen from his car after a show in New Brunswick. Downey performed a sold-out show last night in Fredericton. He had no idea that while he and a friend were later enjoying a meal at a restaurant, someone was stealing two of his guitars. One is worth more than $2,000. The other is his backup guitar. Downey packed up and headed to Halifax for tonight's final show of the tour without his guitars. He plans to rent an instrument for tonight. 
Well, as many people know all too well, life can change in an instant. We tell the stories here day after day. Accidents, illness, job loss, anything can happen. And working your way through that change can be rough. Here and now's Megan McCabe met a man who's gone through some really tough times. But thanks to a job training program at the Salvation Army, Gary Piercy has his life back on track. I come here every morning. I leave here at 12.30, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm free, you know, and I only work five days a week. I like the peace and quiet, and I like the fact that uh, I don't have anybody around me, you know what I mean? It's like it's, I'm autonomous, you know what I mean? Things were just not working out for me. I was a little bit kind of floating, you know, I was kind of like, a bit depressed over things, you know, because things were just weren't working out in my job field, you know. And um, I'd gone, you know, for a while, like being listless, right? Like, and just not, uh, I got out of my routines, you know what I mean? Like, and then, you know, I seen that program there and I said, well, you know, this is a good thing for establishing my routine again, you know, like, it's the question sometimes I ask myself, right? Like, how did it reset my life? Getting up early in the morning, going there, communicating with other people, you know, like listening to other people's opinions, other people's thoughts, you know, like the teachers were really nice, you know, like, and, uh, you know, I enjoyed, like, you know, the interaction with them, you know, like, and that's basically, you know, it gave me the want to, to do it again, you know, yeah. like to get up and find something to, to change, you know, like. Because if you stay, you know, like wrapped in your own little bubble, the world just passes you by, you know. I had my own business and I was working as a stonemason. We put walls into BIS property, say, for example, down there, you know, like all these prestigious properties, Bonaventure Place. It was good, you know, I mean, the work was good, but I was just tired of it, you know. It's like, you get to a certain point, right, you know, your hands start hurting, your back starts hurting, you know, like everything starts to to wear out, you know. It took me away from my kids a lot, you know what I mean? Like I was saying, working 12, 14 hours a day, you know, you get home, you're just like, they're in bed, you know, like, you get up in the morning, you're gone before they get up, you know, like, so really what time do you get, you know, like, you get nothing. Financially, it ruined me, you know, like, because I was used to making a lot of money. And, you know, now I don't make the same money as I even, you know, even here, I don't make the same money as I used to make, right? But I don't care about that, right? You see? Because, in a way, to be happy is much more important than having a lot of money, you know? Like, is it not? Right? Gary Piercy credits the Salvation Army with turning his life around. And this week, the charity launched its fundraising campaign to build a new center of hope right here on Springdale Street. And Piercy says he hopes it's a success to keep helping people like him in their time of need. Megan McCabe, CBC News, St. John's. Off my change of sex designation form. Here and now was there as Gemma Hickey made a life-changing trip to the Office of Vital Statistics. Gemma's story when we come back. Well, the devil is in the details, but where are the details? That's what some people are asking. Uh, days after the Liberal government brought down a budget without providing specifics, stay tuned for that story.
Well, before we get to the all-important weather forecast, uh, we have freezing rain warnings, freezing drizzle warnings, oh. uh, lots of fun to talk about. Accumulating <laughs> snow, even. Yeah, everybody's excited oh, about it. Just <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> uh, but uh, before we get there, I want to show some incredible footage of the ice in Conception Bay last wow. week. Uh, drones have, of course, really become a game changer in giving us uh, a bird's eye view. A lot of things we take for granted, such as the crossing, the tickle from uh, Portugal Cove to Bell Island. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Uh, this video is shot by Cloudbreaker. We've shown you their work before, most recently when fire destroyed uh, the Belvedere Orphanage. Well, as you can see uh, here, the ferry is being escorted across that very ice filled water by a Coast Guard ship. Mm -hmm. I love the slow motion. I, you really get a, a great look at it, your eye can linger on the footage. That's what I like so much about this. Never has ice looked so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff there. Gorgeous. And uh, I believe if you uh, go on YouTube uh, or Twitter for sure, uh, Cloudbreaker does have a, a Twitter account so you can check out more of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. More ice. Let's get to the uh, some Mother Nature's ice that's going to be falling. Uh, in fact, this will be falling as rain, but the issue with freezing rain warnings and freezing drizzle advisories is that it freezes on impact. And the temperatures here at the surface are going to be below zero, and that's going to be the issue. So the freezing drizzle advisory is for the onshore flow tonight along that northeast coast. It has now been expanded to St. John's because we're going to be seeing some freezing drizzle overnight and this will linger into Thursday morning as well. The freezing rain warning is where we're going to be seeing the precip a little bit heavier and the possibility of a little bit more in the way of some ice building up on the cars, possibly the roadways uh, for tonight and in through the early morning hours of Thursday. And that is from our next system, which is rolling in. So uh, there's a quick look at your sustained winds again that we're seeing from the north and northeast, and that has our freezing drizzle set up for tonight along that northeast coast. Temperatures are already back down to the freezing mark, so it's going to be a long night of just that that freezing drizzle that's continuing, and that'll really start to build up on the cars and uh, likely some scraping for most of us tomorrow morning. Uh, note where temperatures are warm right now. Stephenville's at eight, Cornerbrook is at five. Happy Valley Goose Bay is at 9 degrees, but we are going to be seeing temperatures uh, drop ahead of the system tonight as winds become east and uh, northeasterly, and that will have the freezing rain set up before temperatures rise back up and we go back to rain tomorrow. There's the system, which is over the Maritimes, and again, we'll slowly build in tonight. Watch your future tracker. Note the wind contours I have on here, the little wind streamlines, and those show you, yes, with the cool blue arrows, the flow from the north and northeast tonight, but becoming a little more easterly through the overnight tonight along that west coast. And there's that band that we're going to be seeing move in. Possibly a little bit of snow, but I think it's mainly ice pellets and freezing rain for the west and into central parts of Newfoundland. And that'll set the stage for tomorrow morning. So a little bit icy on your way to work and getting those kids off to school tomorrow. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. Temperatures just below the freezing mark for most of Newfoundland. And in fact, Labrador uh, well below uh, freezing in the west. And we're going to be seeing that snow building into the northern peninsula and southeastern parts of Labrador through the day tomorrow. Again, winds will shift to southerly here. Temperatures will rise. Cornerbrook, we're really not looking at much in the way of precip. Central and eastern Newfoundland, some scattered showers. Periods of drizzle in there possible, especially along the south coast. The most notable feature tomorrow will be the cloud cover that just dominates, and I wouldn't even rule out a sunbreak or two uh, from the northeast coast down into the metro region. Note that southerly flow will be helping temperatures to as warm as 5 and 6 degrees in those onshore winds to as warm as 10 degrees possible here in the St. John's in the metro region. Near 6 and 7 for the west into central after those temperatures rise. And again, for the northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador, east northeasterly is an accumulating snow, especially for the Straits Mary, Mary's Harbor, amounts drop off Cartwright and Happy Valley Goose Bay and we're looking at some sunshine and just some scattered flurries for Labrador City and Churchill Falls. In terms of that snowfall, we're generally looking at 10 to 20 centimeters uh, from the northern peninsula into the Straits. I think most will be in that 10 to 15 centimeter range. In fact, Cartwright back through Happy Valley Goose Bay amounts drop off closer to 5 centimeters by the time we get through to Friday morning. Long range details, your weekend update is coming up, Debbie. Thank you, Brian. 
Gemma Hickey was born a female, but these days presents publicly as a male. But it's not that simple. Gemma says after some long and careful thought, neither gender box really fits the bill. Now that realization led Gemma to the Vital Statistics Office in Mount Pearl this morning with an old birth certificate in hand. The goal? To look outside the gender box and formally apply for non-binary gender status on the birth certificate. St. John's morning, host, uh, morning show host Chrissy Holmes tagged along. Gemma, what are you hoping to accomplish here today? Well, I'm hoping to start a process, and um, by that I mean I'm dropping off my change of sex designation form, and because I am non-binary, which means I don't identify as male or female, I, um, I have to uh, write that category in under that and apply, because there's no category there for me, because there's only male or female. For people that might not be in the know, you have been on a transition journey for the last little while. Tell us about what's led you to this point so far. Um, the walk I did across Newfoundland really gave me the time alone to come to terms with a lot of my body image issues and a lot of the feelings that I had as a little child about my gender. And I, uh, you know, at first I came out as uh, gay because I thought that that was the only option for me uh, at the time because trans was not even talked about uh, when I was younger and I'm 40 years old now. So when I did the walk I had to deal with a lot of my um, sexual abuse issues and a lot of my body image issues and um, although I was walking for another cause I really got to know myself a lot better and I did decide after some time and research to uh, go on testosterone. So I've been on testosterone for about 14 months now and uh, feeling great about the changes. I just had top surgery. I had my chest reconstructed in January and I feel great about that, but I don't want any other surgeries. I don't want to change my name. So for me, I want to be seen as a person, and uh, I like Gemma. How are you feeling as you get ready to go into that office right now? Well, I'm just feeling, um, I'm just keeping an open mind. Um, I know the crowd here work hard and they're good people. I'm just dropping off the form, but uh, I'm also um, hoping to start the process so that other people who are struggling with this as well, about not knowing where to fit in, have a uh, place carved out for them as well. And, uh, you know, everybody deserves to feel or be identified as they want. And uh, if this helps kids out there that are struggling right now, then I'm happy to do it for them and, and for me and for many others. Hey, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good. I'm here to change this sex designation on my okay, birth certificate. Sure. Yeah, they have the form filled out, yeah. I have the form filled out, yeah. I had a couple of questions. This is the only birth certificate I have on me. Yeah, sure. Uh, That's perfect. I'm not, I don't identify as male or female. Oh, okay, sure. So there's no other category for me, so I just created one here. Okay. Filled out everything. And I had so Gemma, how did it go in there? It went really well. The young woman who served me was uh, really, really wonderful and respectful. Um, again, I'm not sure what will happen with the, my application, but I'm um, keeping an open mind, and um, it just felt good to, uh, to actually do this. What could happen from here? Do you expect to just get a letter later this week saying, oh, that's great? I mean, what, what are you expecting from this? I have no idea what's going to happen. I, um, I'm keeping an open mind, like I said, and uh, we'll see. But. Uh, you know, I'm prepared to challenge it if I have to, uh, because it's very important. And I know a lot of transgender people out there are, um, are feeling the same and want to be identified as such. So that's it. And this isn't something new. I mean, there are places in the U.S. where non-binary status has become a legal right. Give me sort of the background on, on where that conversation's come. I believe there was a uh, court case in Oregon where they had said that um, a judge ordered that non-binary was a third gender. Um, you know, there's other examples as well, and if you talk to any person who, who studies gender and these types of things um, to get their opinion or whatever, but, you know, things are changing, they're moving in that direction, and people are identifying outside of the male-female binary and seeing things in a different way. And I think from a public perspective, you know, this is really interesting because people struggle with pronouns, people struggle with titles, and I guess there's a lot that we can learn from you in that. I mean, what, what do you want to say to people when we, when we crack this conversation open about how to approach somebody that's transgender, you know, going with using pronouns and all that kind of stuff? You know, it's confusing for people sometimes. I get it. 
I get confused sometimes myself, you know, keeping up with the times on different things. If you want to know how to address a trans person, just ask what pronouns they prefer. You know, um, I want people to know that I'm the same person, um, and I want to be seen as a person. You know, I don't want to change my name. I'm still Gemma, the same Gemma that everybody knows. But I feel very compelled to be open about it because I know there are a lot of kids who are struggling with these types of issues, and um, if I can add to the conversation by changing it somewhat, um, then I'm happy to do it. Well, as we just heard Gemma say, there's often uncertainty and confusion when it comes to pronouns. So what do you do when you don't know? Yeah, and as you heard Gemma's advice is to simply ask which pronoun the person prefers. But barring that, there are a lot of options out there, and we thought it would be nice to show you some examples. Now, we can't list them all. There are a lot. But uh, here are some of the most popular gender-neutral pronouns being used. Just have a look at this. Now you can use they, them, and theirs as a singular general, a gender neutral uh, pronoun. And the example here is uh, Jordan ate their food because they were hungry. Or you can use Z, uh, and that replaces she, he, they. And uh, you can also use here, uh, which replaces her, hers, him, his, their, and theirs. And the example here is Jordan ate here food because Z was hungry. Um, or you can use the person's name. Jordan ate Jordan's food because Jordan was hungry. Now, uh, this may go without saying, but uh, you should never refer to person as it or he, she. Uh, but again, as Gemma said, it's always best just to ask. Yeah, Finance well, Minister is, Kathy Bennett finance, is under pressure everyone. to reveal Speaker, specifics uh, about the exact man. cuts government is making to save money. Details that weren't included in last week's budget. That story after the break.
Well, normally the opposition criticizes government over what's in the budget, but this time the battle is shaping up over what's not in there. Government is refusing to release details about where more than $250 million in savings will come from, refusing at least for now. Here and now, Peter Cowan is here to explain this. So, Peter, what is missing in the budget? Well, Carolyn, the main thing that's missing is details. Government says it's going to save about $280 million this year, but most of the questions from the opposition have revolved around where that's going to come from. We know some general areas like previously announced cuts to management or through zero-based budgeting, but after two days of asking in the House, the answers from government have one thing in common. See if you can pick it out. The estimates discussion provides all opposition, just like it provided us in opposition, the ability to ask questions that would be answered. Be delighted to answer the question in more detail to the member in estimates. And we will provide the details to the questions in the estimates. More details obviously will be coming uh, as we get into estimates. And the estimates will provide the opportunity for further questions. Okay, so estimates there for sure. So what, what are the ministers talking about there? Well, yeah, these are hearings where the top officials from the department as well as the minister, um, they go through the budget. And this is a chance for the opposition to ask for more details. But there are no cameras. It's not broadcast. So if you want to see it, you have to physically go to Confederation Building. So it gets much less attention. And that's why the opposition has been asking about these issues in question period. They want the public to see the answers. And they're frustrated with the overall lack of answers being given. Have a listen. For her to stand in, in question period today and say, well, that's something you should ask, ask in es estimates. Well, no, question period is a place to ask questions. And that's where, that's where we're bringing those questions. And they're just refusing to provide the information. Uh, and that is a concern, absolutely. Wait for the estimates committees, and then we'll answer your questions about this mysterious budget. Mr. Speaker, I say to this honourable House, people don't want to wait till some committee meeting three weeks down the road. They want answers today in the House of Assembly from the ministers responsible. What we've had is the Premier, briefly, and, and the Minister of Finance bobbing and weaving and evading questions. Very straightforward questions. So why doesn't the minister just answer the questions? Well, yeah, that's what we wanted to know when we asked her after question period. Eventually, she said that after the estimates, after all is said and done, that they will release all those details about what's going to be cut. But she bristled at the suggestion that she's refusing to provide the details to us, to the opposition, and to the public. I have not said I wouldn't. I said that all of the pieces that add up to that are in multiple departments, in multiple agencies, boards, and commissions, and they are as low as a division that had four employees and six cell phones, where we've taken two cell phones out. There is a real danger in this, Carolyn. The public is anxious about any sort of possible cuts, and when you have hundreds of millions of dollars that's going to be removed without any details, well, it's left to the opposition and the public to sort of fill in the blanks until we know exactly what's in there. All right, Peter, thanks so much for this. You're welcome. Lots of visitors make the trek up historic Signal Hill. Residents live here too, but that's not without its problems at times. Down below is a 100-year-old water main, and it's breaking down. Now, the city is going to replace it. We'll get the details right after this.
Maine. And Councillor Jonathan Galgay joins me here. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, Councillor, why is the city going to replace the water main and, and why not patch it? Right. The water main itself is just crumbling, Debbie. And uh, residents here have experienced flooding over the past number of years, two significant floods which caused major damage. The city has uh, allocated $2 million. We'll be beginning the work on April the 17th. It will start at the bottom of Signal Hill Road and it will go all the way up to the corner of Cabot Avenue. And it's just below the battery. That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very, very aged infrastructure and it, uh, it really is a priority of this council to, to get it fixed up. So how long is this going to take? It's uh, beginning very soon and uh, how long is the project going right. to last? It's expected to be completed by mid-July, but like any type of major infrastructure, you know, there may be some uh, room to delay it a little bit, you know, until it gets completed, depending on what uh, type of uh, work is required. But we're looking at the middle of July to be completed. This is a heavily used street going all the way up to Signal Hill. A lot of people use it. What are you going to do about the right. traffic? Our priority is to ensure that the liviers here are taken care of. That's our priority to make sure that they have adequate amount of parking and have access to get to their homes. We're going to be rerouting traffic onto Battery Road up Cabot Avenue and then moving further up Signal Hill. We will be allowing tour buses and delivery vehicles to have access to this roadway because they're such large vehicles they would not be able to maneuver uh, up around Cabot Avenue. That's pretty small, isn't it? Narrow. It is very narrow. We have our staff there today. They're putting in some speed cushions. We have some radars there that we're monitoring speeds. So we're really taking this very serious and we're really going to work closely with residents to mitigate any impact. So I imagine there's going to have to be some provision for parking for the residents and is there any uh, threat of them losing water from time to time? There may be some uh, periods where there'll be an interruption in the uh, amount of water Water, but we will be giving them notice so that they can prepare. What will actually happen, residents will be able to park in front of their homes, but when we actually do the infrastructure, we'll have to temporarily relocate them to some side streets, but we're going to work closely with them to find them the places that they can park so they won't be impacted. Now, of course, uh, July 1st, Canada Day is a big day with people uh, trekking up to the top of right. Signal Hill. I understand you've got some prov provisions made for that. We do. 24 hours prior to Canada Day and 24 hours after uh, for that period of time, we will be opening this road for the general public to have access to Signal Hill uh, for the festivities and also for Memorial uh, Memorial Day reflections. Uh, if people want any more information about this, what can they uh, do? They can give the city a call at 311, visit the city's website, contact a member of council, including myself, and we do have a public information session tonight at 7 o'clock at City Hall. Councillor Jonathan Galgay, thanks very much. Thank you. Ryan joins us now to have a look at the weather forecast. So how is the long weekend looking? Generally quiet. Uh, temperatures building towards Sunday, which will be the nicest day here, especially eastern Newfoundland. And most of Newfoundland, in fact, looking pretty good on Sunday. Labrador looking quieter with the uh, uh, potential system looking weaker and a little bit later and we'll have a look at that in just a second as well. Want to start with the freezing rain warnings and the freezing drizzle advisory. So the freezing drizzle advisory is for tonight into the early morning hours of Thursday with that north northeasterly flow blowing in from the North Atlantic temperatures near and below the freezing mark and so some icing on the cars and sidewalks uh, and so you'll want to take your time and be Sure, before you step down onto your front walkway tomorrow morning, the freezing rain warnings are in effect for western into central Newfoundland tied to our next system, which is going to be rolling in from the south. And again, temperatures right now are already showing that freezing drizzle potential set up for that northeast coast. Still quite mild and in fact, 10 degrees right now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but temperatures will drop off tonight uh, ahead of this system, which has again been rolling in through the Maritimes today. But the cold air won't last long. There's some warmer air coming up with this one as well. 17 in Greenwood, Nova Scotia right now. Six in Halifax. And again, those warmer temperatures are going to be creeping in as we roll over the next, uh, well, 12 hours or so. Here's how things are going to play out. Note the north northeasterly flow coming in across the island uh, right now. And that, again, will set up the freezing drizzle potential. That is uh, forecast model not picking it up, but it is there. And as we roll through tonight, there's the freezing rain potential. Corner Brook into central. 
which will then ease as we roll through the, even the mid morning hours of Thursday as the southerly winds kick in. Temperatures will start to rise in a hurry as we work definitely by lunchtime and same thing through central Newfoundland. Any freezing rain will be wrapped up mid to late morning. Looking at that snowfall from the northern peninsula into southeastern parts of Labrador. And again, it's scattered shower and drizzle activity for central and eastern Newfoundland tomorrow. Cloud cover dominating, but overall not a bad day. Six to as warm as 10 degrees across the Avalon for tomorrow. Minus one to minus two for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City. And again, generally 10 to 15 to as much as 20 centimeters. The northern peninsula through southeastern parts of Labrador by the time we get to Friday morning. And this system will taper off pretty quickly to just some lingering flurries on Friday. You'll note the winds that go from more westerly to a northerly direction on the island on Friday. And so that will usher in some cooler air. We'll have a scattered risk of a flurry for both the west and central parts of Newfoundland on Friday. Temperatures likely topping out near four degrees here in the east. Minus two to minus three for you folks in Labrador on Friday. A look ahead to Saturday. You'll, you'll note not a bad day overall. We're in that three, four, five degree range. There's mainly cloudy skies and wouldn't rule out an, again an isolated risk of a flurry along the north coast up into the northern peninsula and then especially back towards Happy Valley Goose Bay and eastern parts of Labrador. Sun and cloud and a chilly day setting up in Lab West. And yes, hip hip hoppity for a Sunday, which looks like the best day uh, for hip hip hopping outside perhaps uh, with uh, temperatures in the seven to as warm as eight degree range. A mix of sun and cloud across most of the islands with some building clouds and a late day chance of showers in the west. Flurries building into Labrador and that is tied to our next system which will then roll in as we roll through the later parts of Sunday into Monday on the island. Here's your updated timeline on that. There's the precip approaching for Sunday evening into Monday morning. Could see some mixing over western parts of Newfoundland and some snow for southern Labrador with this one as we roll into the late Monday, uh, I should say late Sunday, Monday, Tuesday time period. And there is your forecast up to five, six, seven degrees on Monday as well with a bit of a mix bag as the temperatures fall on Tuesday. And there's your forecast in Labrador again, that snow approaching for Sunday into Monday. So we had the hip hoppity Easter rabbit and the Easter chicks. You're getting, we got you're it all. Getting, you definitely <laughs> a bonus Easter graphic coverage this week. <laughs> Time to meet our young athlete of the day who divides his time on the court between two teams. 11-year-old Kaysen Stagg is from Mount Pearl. Kaysen plays basketball with the Mount Pearl Celtics under 12 division and Newtown Elementary Predators. He plays the point guard position on both teams and when he's not doing that, he's practicing his skills. Keep up the good work, Kaysen. You're today's young athlete of the day. She's leaving for L.A. A teen from this province is the only Canadian heading south for a baseball series inspired by the major leagues. We'll tell you all about that after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A 15-year-old Waterford Valley High School student is heading to Los Angeles tomorrow to take part in a girls 16 and under baseball tournament. Andrea Turner will join 100 other girls from the United States for Major League Baseball's first Trail Blazers series. Turner's the only Canadian selected to go. She was in the CBC radio studio this morning to talk to the St. John's Morning Show. I didn't think that I would get this opportunity ever to go to the States to play baseball. I've only been to Ontario and Quebec to play baseball and around Newfoundland. And it was kind of surprised to me. My mom called me on a Friday afternoon and she was like, you got accepted or they chose you to go to the States and play in the Trailblazer series. I know that there's somebody very close to you who can't be with you. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, well, when I was away, uh, my dad passed away. And then the next day I had a game and it was like the best game I ever played. I had two doubles. And then later that day we had a ceremony and they're like MVP for Team Newfoundland, Andrea Turner. I never expect that to happen. So I just, every time I go to practice, I'm thinking about him. I put in 100%. What do you think your dad would think about all this? I think that he would be very proud. Well, now to some national news. Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala Yousafzai received an honorary Canadian citizenship today, just the sixth person ever to be given the honour. Malala is a champion for the education of women and girls around the world, and she used a speech in the House of Commons to urge Canada to play a global leadership role in advancing that cause. David Cochran reports champion for education and a fearless new Canadian, Malala Yousafzai. Malala Yousafzai is a global ambassador for peace, pushed onto the world stage by a horrible act of violence. The world needs leadership. The world needs leadership based on serving humanity, not based on how many weapons you have. Canada can take that lead. <laughs> At just 15, Malala was shot in the face by a Taliban gunman determined to silence her advocacy for the education of girls. She survived and her message was amplified. We were reminded that a bullet is no match for an idea. Malala used this stage as she has every other to advocate for the education of women and girls and in this case to urge Canada to lead. Bring world leaders together and raise new funding for girls to go to school. If Canada leads, I know the world will follow. But Malala also used her platform to praise Canada for helping refugees and to send a message to the United States. I pray that you continue to open your homes and your hearts to the world's most defenseless children and families. And I hope your neighbors will follow your example. She is being honored for courage in the face of violence in a ceremony that was delayed by violence. This was originally scheduled for that day in 2014 when Corporal Nathan Cirillo was murdered and Parliament Hill attacked. But today, Parliament was filled with singing and warm applause, a grand welcome for the country's newest citizen. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The CEO of United Airlines gave his first interview since video emerged of a passenger being violently pulled off a flight. Oscar Munoz says he was horrified by what he saw and he is promising changes at the airline. That is not who our family at United is. And you saw us at a bad moment. And this can never, will never happen again on a United Airlines flight. That's my premise and that's my promise. David Dale was dragged off an overbooked United Airlines flight from Chicago to Louisville, Kentucky on Sunday. He's being treated for his injuries. Cell phone footage of the incident and United's response afterwards has caused an uproar on social media. A judge in Ottawa has sentenced an ex-RCMP officer to 15 years in prison. The former Mountie was found guilty of sexually abusing and torturing his 12-year-old son. The man's name is not being released to protect the identity of his victim. During the trial, the court heard details on how the boy was tortured, shackled and starved. 
The accused was given credit for time served and will spend another 13 years and two months in prison. The boy's stepmother was also sentenced earlier to three years in prison for her role. The Philippines military says the jihadist leader responsible for beheading two Canadian hostages has been killed. Soldiers recovered the body of leader of the militant group yesterday. The remains were at the scene of a battle between Philippine forces and the militant group Abu Sayyaf. Five other gunmen were also killed in the fighting. The militant leader is blamed for taking two Canadian men hostage in 2015. Robert Hall and John Ridsdale were both beheaded along with a man from Germany. Police north of Toronto say this footage is proof no one can escape their eyes in the skies even at night. Yes, this footage captured using their helicopter's thermal camera shows three teenagers trying to steal candy from the Canada's Wonderland Amusement Park. The trio had waited until the cover of darkness to stage their heist, but there was no hiding from the long lens of the law. Well, we'll be back with more here and now after the break. You smile. Take a look at this nosy neighbor. Meet Penny the dog. That's Penny's nose, as you focus. She's also known as Peeking Penny. Her California neighbor constantly saw her jumping just over the shared fence, so she decided to drill holes for Penny to peek through. Now Penny has a full view of her neighbor's yard whenever she likes, and she can enjoy the smells too. <laughs> now that is a great neighbor. <laughs> Well, uh, Ontario's Peel Regional Police have a new watch bird. <laughs> yes, a Canada goose has been guarding the front door of the police station and appears to be very protective of the officers inside. Police say if you're going to the station to be mindful when approaching the door or you might find yourself in for a wild Goose chase. Arr, arr. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, have a look uh, quickly at our setup in the morning. Again, freezing drizzle in the east and northeast, freezing rain in the west into central. 
but as temperatures rise into the afternoon, we are looking much warmer. Could be as warm as 9, 10 degrees here in St. John's. That's the way it's looking right now with some showers. Cloud cover dominating, but not a, a washout. Far from it, in fact. And as we look at our viewer picture of the day, Ooh. Clifford Doran is the lighthouse keeper down at Cape Race. And oh. he snapped this one of the full moon rising with an iceberg. A little taste of everything there. Oh, that wow. is a dandy. Gorgeous. Beautiful full moon rising, as our director says. There's a song about Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Freedom's clear. You I'm got her. Sure. CCR. <laughs> nice. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night.